five for semiotic analysis. Uh, and Apostol Andre will will uh, present us this topic. I don't know if if oh I can I cannot see the presenter actually. Uh, so maybe we can then proceed. How many presenters do we have? Um, we have you have uh, four, but I think uh, yeah we uh, have. Apostle to present. Julian Andre is not in, in the room, so mm -hmm. uh, I can start. That it is the next one, or um, mm -hmm. he's only if you want. Yes, I, I can start. Yeah, Please. yeah. He, okay. Maybe you can start then. Okay. <laughs> Let me see. Let me see where it's going. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Uh, UNESCO Convention 2003 designates intangible cultural heritage as the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, and skills that communicate a community's individuals identify as cultural elements inherited through generations. It puts forward a sense of identity and continuity, strengthening respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. On the UNESCO ICH 2020 list, Islamic calligraphy as a Muslim identity expects its inscription. With the belief of God alone is the creator in Islam, new expressions were created through arabesque, geometry, and calligraphy, generating ambiguity to their function, both as visual pleasure and significant meanings. Brand argues that Islamic ornament rarely demands to be a symbol, Instead, it stands on affirming background with a latent symbolism. For Hildenbrand, it beautifies the structure but can evoke a mystical idea. This debate took place within the first few centuries of Islam. Talibi and Mukadasi said that the multiplicity of forms, colors makes the beholder identify new features for his curiosity and invite contemplation. Al-Ghazali opposed to this, underlining ornaments are uh, related to religious beliefs and the notion of God. Of Islamic ornament, calligraphy, which I'm going to talk today, awards a status higher than Arabesque or geometry. As the medium for transmitting the Quranic words, Arabic script played a spiritually unifying role for Muslims. It was placed in a position regardless of their ethnic or social background. Muslims understand that the use of a night fine script is their religious duty and the most appropriate ornamentation for most building. Forms and styles of calligraphy should be learned to underline epigraphy as a dominant factor in sacred places. Holy inscriptions are visible where Muslims see and learn by heart, while an amalgam of lettering, texture, color, and inscription and blesses the building. Questions arise between Islamic calligraphy and Muslim identity. How is the relationship between Islamic calligraphy and non-Arab Muslims who use their language in semiotic perceptions? Are there different semiotic significations for Muslims between Arabic and the local language in reading the Quran? How about non-Muslims who use Islamic calligraphy? Semiotics is an interpretive framework to describe the process of encoding and decoding. Decoding interprets and evaluates the meaning as regards to the relevant cause. Cause are systems of related convinced for correlating signified and signified in certain domains. However, a dispute appears on perceptual cause for visual perception because people refer to objects in communications to express their feelings and status. To assess my paper questions, Three approaches are attempt. First, uh, three semiotic signs, so shield, signified, and signified in the arbitrary relationship, Rotterdam's semiosphere, which the process of a sign operates in the set of all interconnected environments. The border is in the perception of the beholder, and that one person's semiotic space is another person's non semiotic space. The crossing point of the border of a given culture depends on the position of the beholder. 
My paper invites different semiotic theories for our better understanding of the paper topic intangible cultural heritage, which is acquired and transmitted by sign symbols, and its core is made of traditional ideas and their attached values. So I'm going to talk about the very short Islamic ornament, calligraphy, and then orthodox Islamic culture and syncretic Islamic culture. Orthodox is Saudi Arabia, Arab world, and syncretic Islamic culture is the Indonesia way Islam right. And then like the, I'm talking about the collective memory as a signifier. So uh, but in order to make this research question, symbolic aesthetic ornament, Alberti to Renaissance theoretician proposed that the beauty and ornament of buildings do not represent their construction, that they convey feelings of majesty, authority, and dignity. By moving the passion of the spectator through their architectural splendor, buildings persuade him or her of the majesty of God or the divinity of the state. In all decorative arts, whom divide two groups, the symbol and aesthetic, the former has been chosen for their significance, while the latter for their beauty. Islamic ornament seems to be a conceptual and intellectual rather than emotional, expressing contemporary ideas of beauty and aesthetic concept to communicate the Muslim thoughts and to reflect the spirit of their times. Islamic ornament was inherited from Byzantine and Sasanian culture, and changed over time, stretching worldwide. It cannot be understood without detailed studies of the regional, social, and temporal variations, individual motifs, techniques, and news. So if you see the Dome of Rock, where now this Palestine and Israel has crossed, there, when you see this Dome of Rock the, in the Hassad, you can see calligraphy, geometry, arabesque, but it depends on who you are. If you are Muslim, if you are not Muslim, if you are a tourist, if you, are, you can perceive different, you, you can signify a different way. And here also Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic ornament and Alhambra, Nasiri, this is the end of Islamic in uh, Spain. Also, you can see different. And then here in the most important calligraphy is uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, Quran. Uh, uh, this Quran, which you can see here, these were the first words that God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad and underlined the central role of writing Islamic culture. The Quran chapter 68 opens with the word by the pen and what they write. And the pen was suggested as the first thing created by God to write down coming events. It means every deed is recorded in the book of reckoning for the final count on judgment day. So here you can see the different types of Coptic and Toulouse. And then when you see this also, when you see this Allah, uh, Allah, this uh, words, when you see a le uh, left hand or a left side, this is a uh, uh, geometry. And uh, if you don't know Allah, it's hardly uh, perceive this Allah. However, if you see the other side, this is calligraphy and uh, this red dot, so you can feel how more close the calli calligraphy or uh, so becoming very sacred. And then you can see pulpit, pulpit, this is a Shahada testimony. I bear witness that there is no God but God, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the prophet of God. So this pulpit is very sacred. So whatever put, uh, of course, Shahada is very important. You feel this is sacred how, and then symbolic. However, when they put in the carpet, uh, although that's the same text, you don't feel that because of this carpet. So here, uh, Hagia Sophia, first it was a Byzantine church and then become a museum and now it's a, a mosque. And depends on who you are, it's Allah or whatever, you can perceive a different way. And here also, Tumurid Bibi Hanum, this to show the their, their, maybe their splendor, it can be. So left can be aesthetic, however, right, when you see Mihra, the gateway to the heaven, you cannot say this is an aesthetic because this is the most sacred place. So uh, uh, depends on the space, place, they can change also. And then here, Minaret and Sakabi, uh, Samos, you can see all this minaret to call the prey. You can see it, it can be more, it, it can be symbolic, but it can be aesthetic. It depends on how you perceive. And then Kuri, the Minaret al -Jam, this Afghanistan, uh, this is UNESCO, and this is shows that the, uh, also the power of Islam in this area. So uh, the function change all the time, and particularly, as I mentioned to you, syncretic Islam in Indonesia, they got the inherited from the uh, free Islamic Hindu Buddhism and the uh, animism. So when you see left on the gate, this entrance to the sacred place, we see, it, although this can be message, but it can it is symbolic. And to the right, to the upper part, you can see there this very, very small, 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 uh, small 
uh, had the Allah, so you know, this sect, and then down, there's a uh, uh, tombstone, this uh, sect, because tombstone is the only Islam, uh, the is Sufism, they allow the two pages to the uh, pages to the, their ancestors. So, however, when you see this uh, in Indonesia and do the, uh, during the colonization, you, uh, I just want to pick out the one thing you can see the up, up on the roof. There's Allah with a well, like a neon sign, and besides, you can see the lotus. The so lotus is pre Islamic, that's why they are symbolic. So, you can, uh, and then here, left, left, I just want to talk left, very, very fast. Left, you can see Laya Chipaganti, entrance is green. Green color is the notion of Islam because Umayya, the Prophet had always a green row, row, and then also Oasis concept, the middle point, because of many, many colors, and the green is the middle point, and then uh, Mohammed's uh, uh, clan had a green color. So uh, I don't think that the Dutch colonization, the Indonesian people knew that this is a green color Islam to do, because Indonesia is always green. However, because of the Dutch people, they could go to Mecca, maybe they might see, we don't know. However, this is green, and then we have a texture, and besides Allah. However, to the right, this white, there is a lotus, symbolic, because the lotus came to Islamic, or uh, Hindu Buddhism, and went to the Islam, uh, changing meaning. Here we know this is very sacred. And, uh, and then we are finding the under Sunda Kelapa, this is green color, and uh, so this gate uh, inviting a uh, place uh, this Muslim to come in, paradise, vision of paradise. And to the right, Allah, this is a, a glass. Glass, even though you can use uh, uh, you can use as uh, uh, decoration. So I mentioned in your school 2003, the most important thing is that the transmit from generation to generation is constantly created by communities and groups in response to their environment their interaction with the nature and their history and provides them with a sense of identity continuity. This is intangible cultural heritage identity. So uh, what I want, I, I don't have time to read all, but what I want to say, collective memory, this is very important for us. When we have collective memory, then uh, they signify different way. So for Halbach's individual memory is understood through a group context, while collect, uh, collective memory develops further as people keep their history. Symbols, architects, and literature are references for binding people to past generations and influencing their memory. And every collective memory relies on specific groups described, described by space and time. The group constructs memory and the individuals to the work of remembering. So most important is the collective memories have depended on the context of remembering. In dealing with this, a group can seek a reassurance for their decision from the past. By doing it, collective remembering brings a selection of narratives which can respond both to present and to future needs. So I made the first three cases which you remember first, and then Ferdinand, because now Islamic calligraphy and Muslim Islam, uh, what is the signify? Who is the signify? Who is the signify? This is very difficult to say because it depends on the, the collective memory. And the, we have an icon uh, index symbol, but the index symbol, I have a problem because the symbol can be index, index can be symbols. I'm still struggling uh, there. And however, Lottman's model, she may speak, the metaphor to offer a special model for interpreting culture. Lottman's theory of culture functions in addressing religious pluralism and the according of the range to keep the semiotic space with other religious manifestations. The unlimited semiosis demands interpretation to rediscover the cognitive aesthetic immanence of the human mind, the source of the religion. Its dynamism interconnects with human cultural space, the semiosis. A space. So what I meant is that if you have a, a Hindu Buddhism background, if you have Paganism background, if you have a Christian background, you will see, you will perceive differently, you will, because they signify different way, and then you will make a semiotic interpretation. So just before ending, I had a, a research in Kuwait, and what they say, Arabic, and then Kuwait is Orthodox Islam, not syncretic. Uh, so Arabic calligraphy has applied to religious art as a last tool for keeping Muslim identity. How, moreover, it has utilized beauty in an applied art that Muslim can enjoy calligraphy with a pleasure. So if you ask the Muslims there, they say the home is to God every moment in my life, keeping identity. I love calligraphy. Calligraphy is a special art of Islam. For me, beauty means everything. They have Arabic calligraphy in Kuwait became one of the Kuwaiti elements. So this is one of very, you cannot see it. Uh, can you find any calligraphy? But this is calligraphy as well. 
before the, this Muhammad Kambar, this is very important. He wants to show his identity through the calligraphy, through art. And here you can see very little calligraphy, but the powers also he used in his ceramic or architecture. So conclusion, Islamic ornament should be searched in their interpretation and hidden meanings. The symbolic element is an agent between the identifiable reality and the mysterious domain of religion, philosophy, and magic, extending the conscious understanding into the unconsciousness. Islamic calligraphy is a both symbol and aesthetic. In my view, it applies to orthodox and simply Islamic architecture because Muslims can judge the function of Islamic calligraphy as a symbolic or aesthetic or both, depending on their traditions, cultures, perceptions, experiences, emotions, particularly collective memories in the name of God. Whether Islamic calligraphy was applied to religious or secular objects, the practice, representations, and expressions are intangible, are transmitted and recreated through generations and for communities. It is a signifying, signified living heritage within the new sphere with its iconic or index or symbolic function. Following the 19th English Victorian critic Ruskin's word, all noble ornamentation is the expression of a man's blood in God's work. It needs our intangible semiotic interpretation to Islamic calligraphy. Thank you. Thank you. He, you, you did it perfectly, like <laughs> fifteen minutes. Uh, but actually, actually, since we do, we, do, we don't have any other presenters, so I think you, you can, can, talk, you, yeah, you, yeah. You can yeah. use a little bit more time. I mean, if you want yeah. to stress something else. No, no, no. I know. I know. Maybe part two. Maybe later. We will see. <laughs> okay. We can. We shall... Yeah. We will see later. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Maybe maybe Thank someone you. has uh, questions. Um, so please. Feel free to ask questions, but don't forget about the microphone. Yeah, Alexander, I think it's proper to, to have a quick Q&A at the final presentation. Uh, uh, at, at, to, to be more time and to manage okay. very well your panel. He suddenly, uh, you are as amazing. Ten well, minutes okay. in, uh, it's very, very, very quickly with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know who is talking, but anyhow, thank you. It is a man, gentleman. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> I am sorry. Oh yeah, okay, hi. I don't know. Hi, thank you. <laughs> now you can see me. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Oh. You are handsome always. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, but but as I said, we don't have other presenters. So I don't know, maybe we can then uh, okay, I will maybe continue with my presentation and maybe we can use a bit more time for questions then. Absolutely, okay. Alexander. Enjoy okay. your time, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I, I'm I'm not sure I can actually. I was thinking about um, about um, twenty minutes, so I am not sure I can manage that well. But I will try. Well, uh, okay. Let me let me uh, share my screen. Okay. Here it is. Okay. I hope you can see. Hope you can see the slides. Um, so hello everyone, one more time. Uh, my name is Alexander and I'm a PhD student uh, of the University of Tartu. Uh, and I'm um, in my PhD researching uh, learning processes and the development of sign operation and learning, especially in contemporary digital culture. So with that, I'm also trying to access uh, and, and actually um, analyze the actuality of, of Lev Vygotsky's uh, framework for analyzing learning in, in digital culture. Also researching, I'm also researching inner speech and meaning making. And um, I have been recently involved in uh, the project Education on Screen, which I will talk about briefly today. Uh, and my talk today is supported by the European Regional uh, Development Fund uh, or the Astra project. Um, so um, today I will talk about the role of artistic literacy and its acquisition in the contemporary educational environment and rather uh, pose the question of, of whether we have actually reconceptualized the role of artistic literacy in contemporary educational environment. And so to start with, I would like to uh, ask a rather rhetoric question of how actually we consider the contemporary educational environment. Is it uh, something like that or is it more something like that? Um, so that's a pretty rhetoric thing. And another thing also is how we also consider uh, a contemporary uh, classroom. Also, is it something uh, like this or is it more something like this? So, of course, the contemporary educational environment is very much 
associated with the uh, increased level of interactivity, uh, use of new media and also digitality. And all these uh, characteristics of contemporary learning environment, of course, bring uh, the new literacies together, which actually uh, capture many of the complexities of living, learning and working in the contemporary information world. So you can see here uh, um, um, the statistics from stored this popular presentation, which cites many different new types of literacies. Uh, and also here I put uh, the most popular, so to say, groups of literacies that we face uh, in, in um, educational research today. These are multiliteracies, digital and informational literacies, which are we all obsessed with today, so to say, meta literacies, of course, and media and transmedia literacies, which have been very uh, actively uh, developing recently. Uh, but it doesn't mean that these literacies actually kind of replace the more fundamental literacies like a literary literacy or, or artistic literacy, uh, for instance, but rather they, they uh, keep on based on that literacies. Uh, and of course, uh, with this new taxonomy or landscape of literacies, we of course have to have to reconsider of the role of, of these fundamental literacies. And one of them is of course this artistic uh, literacy, which uh, commonly is known as the knowledge and understanding required to participate authentically in the arts. And this is the definition of, of the coalition uh, for core art standards. Um, but uh, of course, uh, both this new taxonomy of literacies and, and the reconceptualization of, of um, contemporary learning environment uh, pose us to, to address of what it means to be artistically literate today, especially considering of, of what an artistic text actually is today. So again, we, we face uh, this rhetoric question of whether an artistic text today, which learners actually face, is uh, more like this, or is it actually something more like that? Uh, the, the collection of different, uh, I don't know, YouTube videos, uh, different uh, uh, digital databases, and so on and so on, right? So these are different, those uh, mediums which learners get the, the, the necessary knowledge with. Um, and so, of course, this, this is another aspect of which, uh, which brings us to the question of what does it mean to be artistically li literate uh, in, in contemporary digital education environment. And we will address this question uh, using three different levels, the level of artistic literacy or what is actually the role of artistic, sorry, level of artistic text or what is the role of artistic text in education today. Uh, the level of mediation or how this mediating abilities of an artistic text has actually uh, evolved and also level of literacy meaning of how does artistic literacy actually stand in which connection does it stand with other uh, literacies or with this whole literacy uh, taxonomy. So um, we start with the um, uh, level of artistic text and here we should of course uh, mention um, like the main the main aspects of characteristics of artistic text uh, um, uh, in learning and education especially and here I would like to refer to Vygotsky who mostly was uh, researching the role of artistic text in education and developed a very uh, live framework for that and uh, <clears throat> The first uh, aspect of artistic text and education is, of course, the communicational aspect, meaning that even from the early childhood, we, we use artistic texts as a means of, of communication. And even actually in childhood, we use the more of needs of communication, but we keep using it even in adulthood with a more kind of already developed um, way of using artistic languages. Another aspect is the aspect of language and form in meaning making, uh, which actually stands for the uh, development of, uh, of, of using artistic languages for conveying specific meanings, uh, and which also stands for an important um, a notion of the emotion of form, uh, where actually we face with a situation where a very specific uh, form of information is also uh, conveyed with a very specific, uh, sometimes even very abstract, uh, artistic form. And understanding of this emotion of form and development of, of actually using the emotion of form in learning very much enlarges the poss possibilities of learners, not only in accessing the information by means of artistic languages, but also in the production and sharing, uh, uh, learning uh, information or, or so to say knowledge by means of artistic languages. Uh, 
And finally, uh, also um, an important aspect is, is uh, the use of language as a source of learning. Of course, we cannot use artistic languages as such sources of learning as, as databases or academic books. Uh, however, of course, um, uh, artistic languages, they mediate uh, knowledge and mediate uh, a very specific form of information also in a very specific way, meaning that uh, they never uh, mediate reality uh, as, as a coherent whole, so to say. Um, and an important factor here is that actually um, uh, the use of artistic texts and learning also, also um, um, fosters, uh, fosters the development of a special way of reasoning which actually relies on different psychological, cognitive and, and semiotic processes. Um, when we talk about the change on mediation abilities of, of artistic text, and here we of course should, should um, refer to the processes of convergence and uh, divergence in culture, which Peter Torov was talking about yesterday, so we'll not very go very deeply into, into this analysis, as I hope it was, it was a very, very thorough uh, presentation. But we will just uh, mention some important things uh, that which influence actually artistic literacy and, and, and the role of artistic text in learning uh, specifically. Uh, so meaning that the, when we talk about the divergence, then of course we have to emphasize the role of, of cultural auto-communication or in other words, how culture communicates its main text. And this process of cultural auto-communication has been recently very much um, uh, dependent on the transmedia processes, meaning that uh, the dispersal of a text across uh, different platforms or rather telling of new events from the particular story world across various media platforms. And here we can actually uh, remember, for instance, the Harry Potter universe or story world, right? With its different, um, with, with the spreading of the story across really different, different uh, dimensions and uh, different platforms. Um, so another uh, process uh, which is, is, is relevant to the mediation side of artistic text is convergence uh, or as a technological hybridity that has folded the uses of separate media into one another. And in this sense, uh, cross-mediality uh, is rather an integration of all uh, text represented in different media into one text, which actually is something that we normally deal with and actually learners very much deal with in, in particular uh, learning practices. And uh, in this regard, uh, one of the most probably vivid examples of how uh, the affordances of cultural convergence are used in education is the use of educational platforms or digital platforms. And one of the examples of this is our project Education on Screen, where, uh, which is also a, a digital uh, educational platform, which is meant for mediating a particular story world. Uh, and um, uh, here is an example of one of the platforms, which is called Literature Screen, which mediates a popular novel of uh, Estonian folklore. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is a novel uh, which tells the story uh, of the like 19th century, you know, with all these different uh, rituals and a lot of cultural elements. And of course, when when um, reading the story, learners often need some additional guidance, and that's that was one of the one of the aims of the platform. So maybe I will briefly show you. I don't. Know, I hope you can see right what I'm showing. Uh, hope you can see my screen. Um, so, and the main part of this platform, of course, is uh, is a digital um, is a digital map, uh, meaning that uh, it it serves as this guideline for learners where they can uh, click on different elements on this map and see what it means uh, what it means uh, actually in the novel. What this cultural element means, for example, what is the role of, of, of sauna in Estonian folklore and Estonian culture uh, and, and how it relates to contemporary culture as well. So this, this digital map kind of serves as a guideline, but also on the platform we have different um, activities which are meant, uh, of course, mostly on um, mediating the idea of the, of, of the story world, like increasing meaning making of the story world, but at the same time, uh, these different different uh, interactive and digital activities are made to uh, help learners develop their skills in digital reading. In other words, how we read and and uh, also acquire the, the the artistic 
artistic literacy in, in digital reading and contemporary learning environment. Um, okay, but if again, if you are interested more about it, we can uh, talk more during during the question section, or you can also visit uh, the website and, and get familiarized with it more. Of course, the platform also also mediates uh, the, the the role of cultural um, divergence, showing showing how a particular uh, story, a particular novel, is mediated in other. Uh, artistic uh, languages and, uh, for example, it mediates these different versions and adaptations in, in, in video games, I don't know, operas, films, and so on and so on. Uh, of course, when talking about artistic literacy as any other literacy of uh, as well today, we should uh, definitely uh, consider its relations with the new taxonomy of literacies, meaning that, and also with the new uh, educational environment and, and, and the um, uh, challenges that it brings to the, to the, to the learning paradigm. Uh, and here we should emphasize the necessity to consider artistic literacy not as a separate literacy, which which uh, somehow should be acquired in learning, but rather as an integrated part of transliteracy uh, presented by Sukovic, which is actually a fluidity of movement across the field between a range of contexts, modalities, technologies, and genders, meaning that artistic literacy should not only focus on the way uh, it, uh, on, on the mediational aspect, so to say, or understanding particular information via artistic text, but rather also develop other necessary skills and competences related, uh, related to learning in, in contemporary digital environment. Um, of course, another important aspect of, of, of uh, any literacy is how it is acquired uh, and developed. And the experience with education on screen showed us that uh, there are two important uh, aspects in the acquisition of artistic literacy, and the first one is acquisition of artistic literacy as a psychological tool, meaning that uh, acquiring, again here we're referring, referring slightly to Vygotsky, meaning that acquiring artistic literacy as this special uh, mediator, which uh, or symbolic mediator, which can be used um, also for problem solving. Uh, of course, acquisition of of psychological tools requires a very special learning paradigm, which is different from, from learning content knowledge. And it presupposes usually a, a deliberate learning process and the systematic acquisition of these symbolic tools. And of course, they focus on the generalizing functions, meaning that uh, making it possible to use artistic languages as mediators in different uh, learning contexts and in different contexts in general. Another important aspect is the use of intersemiotic translation for the acquisition of artistic literacy, which actually helps um, um, to, to uh, develop the learner's understanding of the relations of a particular text with other texts and, 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 and um, um, analyze these relations. And um, the intersemiotic translation as uh, an interpretation of verbal signs uh, by means of science of nonverbal science systems and vice versa, uh, helps learners also to distinguish between this artistic form, right, or this um, 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 psychology of form, so to say, and, and the meaning of an artistic text. And uh, also, uh, in terms of the acquisition of artistic literacy, we can, we can argue that artistic text can be mediated through other artistic text or text of natural language. In other words, text of particular science systems are translated into different types of texts and, and effectively become intertext, which also in, in increases um, fosters, fosters meaning making in learning. Uh, this is what we also, uh, how we also approach it in, in education on screen, offering uh, learners an ability to, on the, on the one hand, to present them the different forms of artistic languages and analyze them as languages, and then also uh, uh, offer them possibilities of, of, uh, of practicing their skills in this intersemiotic translation. Uh, for instance, in this literature on screen platform, we are uh, dealing with the question of how a literary text can be translated into a cinematic text or vice versa, how a cinematic text can be translated to literary text. And here learners also analyze the different, different aspects or different kind of characteristics of each language. Uh, for example, they also are involved in creating a scenario for a film or um, building a storyboard or experimenting with, with the colors or experimenting also with different soundtracks for different scenes and seeing how, how the meaning is changed by, by, by changing these different, different um, 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 
aspects of, of, of um, uh, artistic languages and so how it, it is refers to the semantics. Uh, of course, an important part here would be to mediate learners with, with how a particular uh, artistic text refers to its other representations, other um, adaptations in culture, also how it refers to its prototext, right? To this different, for example, in this, in this particular novel, to different uh, um, folklore texts. Uh, and when we're talking about artistic literacy, of course, we are not uh, trying to limit uh, the question of artistic languages only to some classical forms of artistic languages, but rather uh, referring to uh, very different formats, including memes and parody parodies or animations and so on and so on, of course, gradually, gradually uh, acquiring the aspects of each language. Um, and my final word would be about, about the assessment of artistic literacy, because this is one of the most one of the most problematic and, and, and uh, challenging ways of acquiring any form of literacy, but uh, artistic literacy especially. And here it is very important uh, to measure, not so to say the content side of, of learning, but rather uh, the uh, child's evolving individual ability to master these psychological tools or symbolic mediation uh, in the process of development. And this appears to be possible by, by integrating uh, the concept of dynamic assessment, which also was developed by Vygotsky, but is now very much reconceptualized. And this dynamic assessment thing uh, allows us um, and uh, uh, offers us an approach to understanding individual differences and their implications for instructions that embeds intervention within the assessment procedure. In other words, we uh, assess not the specific content which learner has acquired, but rather how uh, the learner has developed its own ability to use this mediation or med uh, symbolic mediating tools as artistic languages in learning for specific problem solving. Uh, and uh, one of the methodologies which is based on the dynamic assessment was, was presented by the project Beyond Text, uh, which works with using uh, artistic, uh, artistic um, analysis in, in uh, scientific research. Uh, and this uh, methodology is based on using reflective sketchbooks, which also are part of this dynamic assessment as well. So you can see here in the pictures that the idea of, the, of these reflective sketchbooks is that learners uh, already use the, the, um, the artistic literacy to create a specific uh, assessment paper, which is actually an, kind of also an artistic work, so that an artistic work here is not only like the, the assessment kind of focus, but also a method of, of, of assessment, which is a very important thing as, uh, again, we refer to, to the uh, Vygotsky's framework as uh, assessment here becomes uh, inseparable from learning. It creates the interaction with, in the class and also creates an interaction with culture. Again, here we are not talking about developing any artistic skills, but rather forms of communication, right? Forms of using different uh, artistic forms and also using, um, using art as a source of learning. So again, coming back to that thing that, which we were talking about. Um, so yeah, uh, um, so this is, this is one of, of, of the ways. Here, I, in my presentation, I tried to pose, pose these questions of, of how we can reconceptualize uh, artistic literacy in contemporary learning environment. Of course, it's a big, big research which has to be done further. And now I'm, I'm uh, very much involved in the further research, uh, trying to uh, address the question of how our inner speech is involved in meaning making of artistic texts um, and, and also trying to address it from the uh, very interdisciplinary point of view. So this is, will be like a, kind of the next step in, in this research, but uh, I was trying to be brief. So if you have any uh, kind of questions, ideas, or rather maybe some experiences with artistic literacy or how it is, is developed in education, I will be very happy to, to discuss it as I think this is, this is the focus of any kind of <laughs> scientific uh, conference to to share our experiences, to share our knowledge on some, some fields. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, and I, I see that we have another uh, presenter. Uh, Avatar, can you hear us? Uh, we cannot hear you. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I am late because I had uh, a problem to access this session, technical problems. 
So thank you very much. Um, uh, first, I have to say that I'm not fluent in English, so I hope you will uh, forgive my mistakes. Okay, uh, so um, I will share uh, my presentation. It's okay. You can see it. Okay. Yeah. So, my paper is on North South visual hegemony and cultural crisis disorders in the Islamic semiosphere. And uh, this paper addresses the phenomenon of identity withdrawal in Islamic communities as a defensive response to symbolic hegemony. It uh, focuses on um, the analysis of some counter visual strategy and the cultural tension of a semiotic nature with the West. The manifestation of this tension are reflected in the visual scenario and revolve around iconic practices such as the use of image, spectacularity and semiotization of the woman's body. Um, so the paper aims from the semiotic theory and the theory of uh, image to explore the disorders produced by the dominant cultural visual model and in subaltern visual semiotic system, such as uh, Muslim culture. Uh, so it uh, uh, will address these uh, three points, rethinking interculturality from the semiotics of the image, geopolitics and uh, the coloniality of the gaze and the uh, crisis of the Islamic visual order. So um, throughout the 20th century, identity discourse in Mediterranean Islamic societies was constructed around two collective trauma, the colonial event and the settlement of visual culture. These two occurrence, uh, occurrences have reaffirmed the representation of identity through the prism of difference and duality, us and the other. Uh, today, the post-colonial process in these societies drags with it a memory full of embedded intercultural conflicts that have found in religious fundamentalism a way of manifesting identity. We could speak of a symptomatology inherent to any post-colonial process with a resolved issue related to bilingualism, biculturalism, and uh, the dualism between secularism religion and tradition uh, modernity. This cultural tension manifests itself, especially in practices around the image, spectacularity, and representation. Some cross-cultural incidents in recent decades confirm this drift toward hypervisuality. The conflicts over the veil and uh, caricatures uh, of Muhammad, the 1911 and Charlie Hebdo attacks uh, or staging of ISIS terrorist acts are not only a symptom of civilizational discomfort in the Arab and Islamic world, but also of the crisis of postmodern visual culture, diluted and undermined by spectacularity. Yuri Lotman's reflection on the semiotics of culture provides an ideal theoretical approach to analyze how the Im image become the language of cultural tension. This conversion occurs the borders of the semiotic space. That is where, according to Wolchenstein, cultural structures articulated as center and peripheries interact on the geoculture scene. The concept, the concept semiosphere coined by Yuri Lotman has contributed to, to the exploration of the semiotic dimension of culture and the semiotic mechanism of regulation of inter intercultural tensions. To what extent could this concept of the semiosphere help us in the analysis of the impact of the dominant visual culture on peripheral visual systems? Lotman explained that the transformation of semiotic systems depends on the evolution of technology. The great scientific technical revolutions are invariably intertwined 
by uh, with semiotic revolutions that decisively change the whole system of socio-cultural semiotics today image technology has become the space where cultural meanings move and around the image generating new semiotic language the transition from the linguistic to the iconic could be traumatic in those cultures whose visual codes impose a different regime of social representation and functionality on the image. It's the, it's the, it is therefore necessary to explore the effects of the hegemonical visual culture order on other non-Western visual culture models or regimes of gaze, as well as the crisis that this asymmetry could cause within peripheral semiotic spaces and uh, in their relationship with the dominant culture. Arab and Muslim societies are facing a profound crisis caused by the disruption of very visual patterns since the invention of the technological image at the end of the 19th century. Their cultural order has been progressively altered by new regimes of gaze that deeply clash with their own visual codes. For more than a century, Muslim society, like other subaltern culture, uh, societies, have been subjected to a visual coloniality, uh, coloniality, living in the paradoxical reality of consuming image produces, produced by other while living detached from the production of their technology and its main circuits. Of dissemination. The geopolitical division between image consuming and image producing culture established by visual discursive hegemony on a global scale leads us to consider cultural visual semiotics as a suitable approach for analyzing intercultural poly politic and social events. New technologies have turned the image into the main communication axle in a world that is increasingly connected and ruled by visual practices. Mitchell, one of the main founders of the image theory, holds the thesis, uh, the thesis according to which iconic language dominates the global semiotic scene to the point of establishing its own communicative order apart from spoken and written language. This transformation leads us to consider the relationship between visual culture practices and the power structures that are articulated in the context of the current world system. The technology of the image, which has established a new global culture by setting up the visual as a place where meanings are created and discussed. We could speak of a global iconosphere in which the abundant visual signs that flow through the new communication technologies have become the main vehicles of the meanings of postmodern globalized culture. Arab and Muslim societies are deeply affected by two key events that have disturbed their visual semiotic order and their regime of gaze. First, the separation between the image and the sacred. Islam was conceived as an iconic and idolatrous culture that established a sacred link between image and religion. Historically, the monotheism of Islam as opposed to polytheism developed in its Sunni side an aversion to the image because of its power of representation and simulation. The production of images gradually died out in the fields of the art and handicrafts and was replaced by calligraphy, while linguistic rhetoric flourished in literature and poetry. In the cultural sphere, the Islamic religious universe has been establishing its own semiotic order that strictly organizes a social visual regime based on a policy of maximum semiotization of the body. This policy seeks to control sexuality and gender differ differentiation, so evident in the urban planning that separates female and male spaces, but it also involves the regulation of the gaze, 
body image, and clothing norms that reinforce the visual distinctions between women and men. The woman's veil in this sense is a device that fulfills the function of organize, organizing the gaze in the public space and at the same time restricting the male gaze toward women. In short, the visual order in the Muslim semiosphere has been subjected to a process of hypersemiotization that has turned any social practice and interaction into visual codes that make up its cultural modeling system according to Lotman's concept. The modeling system of Muslim cultures have, uh, has made up for the absence of the image, but by developing an iconic perception of social practices and a highly elaborated and defined social visual order. The second key that uh, has altered the Islamic visual order is the, emergen uh, the emergence of the image technology, photography and film, and the shift in visual regimes in contem contemporary society. The beginning of this visual shift coincided with the colonial era, a period in which the West began to produce a visual ethnographic discourse on the other which has generated a dominant Western gaze on the Islamic world. On the other hand, the new visual language has established codes and narratives techniques that have become the only possible means of self-enunciation of other cultures, in a way that the self-enunciation of non-Western cultures is given through the visual language of the other those creating a dominant discourse surrounded by peripheral discourses. In this matrix of power, we found a device of hegemony and control over meanings and their circuits of transit on a global level, concentration of media, information, image, cultural and industry, etc., which articulates the colonial gaze. The technological development of the, uh, and the consequent growth of the digital breach have turned the global iconosphere into a reduced and not very inclusive space for non-Western cultural manifestations and expressions. These changes have altered the visual semiotic order of Islamic societies and have caused cultural traumas whose most visible consequence has been a strong identity and religious withdrawal. In recent decades, these traumas have materialized in conflicts over image. Uh, image and representation, such as the Charlie Hebdo attack, the film The Life of Muhammad, or the conflict over the veil and the burqa in Europe. These conflicts reflected, uh, reflect a semiotic cultural clash that inscribes images and visual practices in geopolitical power relations. Perhaps in, the ten, in this tension, we could find the explanation for some of the behaviors observed in Muslim societies in recent decades, such as the intensification of religious rituals, semiotization of appearance like the veil, beard for men, praying in public spaces, etc., that we could interpret as a process of visualization and exhibition of religion and cultural affirmation in the dominant visual order. Religion would thus be inscribed in the new visual culture. Along the same lines, we could interpret the recovery by fundamentalist groups of some symbols like the woman veils, uh, as an act of rejection of the gender model conveyed by the dominant visual culture, and also as an attempt to recover their own semiotic order prior to the global visual culture. The discomfort of the Islamic visual order manifests itself through behaviors that are inscribed in a reactionary discourse, counter-visuality, 
in Mirzov's terms, which could lead to extreme practices of symbolic and physical violence, the burqa as a metaphor for the disappearance of women and Islamic State propaganda videos are some examples that illustrate this extreme deviation. The aim of products producing this visual impact is to draw attention in a world dominated by hegemonic visualities that eclipse other peripheral expressions uh, diminished by oblivion and uh, marginalization. The image as a new space for the negotiation of meaning become the stage on which international politics uh, unfolds. Um, the dominant visual practices generated by the West since the emergence of the era of the image have caused a profound disruption in the visual codes of non-Western societies. This is the case in Muslim cultures, where the regime of the gay structures all um, semiotic expression around strict rules that meticulously uh, organize visibility and dissimulation. The iconic turn that has transformed the image into the new paradigm of the dominant postmodern culture has, within the dynamics of globalization, destabilized the visual reference of an Islamic culture order marked by iconoclastic tradition. In recent decades, the conflict between the West and the Islamic world has developed in a semiotic universe in which the image has been at the core of political and cultural discomfort. The conflict related to the Muhammad cartoons, women's veil, and the terrorist act of ISIS turned into to television, uh, television spectacle are a symptom of the crisis of the image in postmodern culture and its growing power on the social scene. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think I think uh, we are with presentations. So maybe we can switch to questions then. I have a question. Okay. I have two questions, but uh, I will I would I would uh, speak about one of them now. For uh, Ms. Uh, Hisok Inyoja, uh, about cultural differences, what kind of books do you recommend or what kind of materials do you recommend to read in order to understand better the cultural differences? I, uh, you, thank you for the question, but I, I can ask to myself because there are so many books. So my first uh, advice is uh, travel, travel first, traveling, and then meet the people. And then once you get a kind of uh, impression, then you can read a book because the book is a part of a part of what they experienced. So I recommend you that uh, travel first and then have experience. And then from there, you can start to find the book because there are so many books. And what is the notion of a culture? Now we have a big problem in UNESCO because you know, the notion of intangible cultural head, what is intangible, what is tangible, like that, okay? So you have to read all this not book, first the travel and experience and the, uh, the empirical work, then you can find book from, just write down from Google, it comes so many. <laughs> okay, uh, I was thinking about also to write you an email first, but I was also ask, asking the question. And the second one for uh, Miss Ketiti, how we can track the culture um, advancement? I mean, how the culture are, cultures are, are constantly changing. How do we keep track with what does it matter? What should we read?
Can I, sorry, can I turn your microphone on, please? We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. If you have, um... you have your microphone off. I'm yeah. sorry. I, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear all the question. I have a um, problem. I'm sorry. Uh, from you, I understand that the cultures are constantly changing. Um, what are you supposed to read in order to know them better, to know them how they evolved? Yes, uh, first we have to understand that, the, to, to assume that uh, the change is, um, is a, a natural characteristic of human culture. So uh, we have to assume that um, uh, we have to be more uh, open and flexible in order to um, and try to, to understand uh, uh, also values and um, uh, the semiotic codes of uh, uh, other culture. We are we are living uh, actually in a globalized uh, um, world. Uh, and um, it's um, in, uh, it's a, a new form of uh, living with the others. So uh, we have to understand that uh, the difference, uh, the differences, and, and the particularity of every culture is uh, um, make us more 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 rich and more uh, open and tolerant. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question to the first speaker, no, no, first it's my second speaker, second, second speaker. You mentioned about the learners, who, uh, learners, who are learners? Because it depends on learners, the image, the artistic, uh, artistic uh, text or artistic image can have, must have a responsibility. So who are learners? <laughs> that's that's a good question. Um, yeah, especially in terms of in terms of a, a, a bigger scope of research. But um, well, of course, if if we are talking about um, so to say, what I, will, I I have been dealing with in in my study and in terms of this education on screen project, then uh, of course we were mostly considering the school students. Uh, and mostly here in Estonia, the the gymnasium students. So these are classes from uh, like from the ninth to to, to the twelfth. So that's these are um, kind of the focus of, of what 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 is issued. But of course, of course, uh, like um, again, uh, we have been sometimes using um, using the the methodology of the project also with adults. And basically, we're talking about uh, artistic uh, mediation and artistic languages, and they use them, they use them in, in, in learning, so to say. I should say that I, I, I wouldn't yeah. say that there's a kind of huge difference between between school students and adults in that in that respect. So in this sense, we we kind of all um, have more or less similar needs in developing this this mediating abilities over with artistic languages. So. Basically, yeah. Uh, the only what the only thing which diff like the changes sometimes, right? Is 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 the aesthetic side of it, right? But not the so to say the semiotic or the or the content side of that. Okay. No, because this is a homogeneous society, it might work. But multiple religious society, it can. So we need a responsibility. Mm. This text as a responsibility. So do you have any? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally agree. And also, also if we uh, talk about about multicultural societies, for instance, uh, because in our project we also were considering uh, multicultural societies and how actually artistic texts also deal with the question of of so to say, uh, cultural conflict, right? And, and mediating the same cultural event with different, so to say, perspectives. Uh, as, as also in Estonia is a very multicultural uh, cultural society. And so that's, that, that's a separate, a big part of this research as well. If you, if you actually, basically, if you are interested in this question, I would uh, recommend you to go there to this uh, history and screen project. It's, it's also available in English. And it's mostly deals with with um, uh, cultural memory and also mediating uh, mediating various cultural events in in uh, um, 
we are different, so to say, cultural languages are also from, from different, different cultural perspectives and how it, this can be approached also in terms of school education. So I, I can also share this if you're interested. I have a question to the third speaker. Uh, 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 okay. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> because uh, uh, calligraphy uh, is uh, Islamic uh, art. We have a calligraphy and uh, geometry and arabesque, okay? And so that's why they don't have a living figures, living figures, because uh, Muhammad is the, how you show the visual images to show the Islam. So how this visual image can uh, lose the sacredness? in terms of Islamic uh, is, uh, artistic attitude. These visual images, can, can you hear? Please turn your microphone on, we cannot hear you. Did you hear, did you hear what I say? N not all the... Um... Uh, I'm sorry, the sound is not <laughs> here. Oh. <laughs> I had a trouble with my, my connection, so I, I didn't... Uh, okay, I will talk very slowly. Okay. Yeah. Oof, disappear. The, the sound disappears, sorry. Because in Islamic attitude, artistic attitude, Okay, I don't ask. <laughs> no, no, please. Can you write the question? Can you write the question? Sorry, really, uh, the sound. Um, can you write the question? Yeah, you can post it in the chat. In the ch so yes. It's easier. Can you please stay? <laughs> you can hear the sound because I, I can't. No, I think it's it's yeah, it's difficult to hear. So he, you can you 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 may just write in the chat your question and yes, we can answer. A... Maybe someone else has has other questions yeah. while we are waiting. You can also post in the chat those those who cannot use um, their microphones uh, for some reason. You can post your uh, question. He. Because I, I actually had a question to he. Uh, I am not. I'm... Sorry. Yeah, please, please. Yeah, I had the question. I, I don't know if we can hear. I mean, uh, because of the because of the quality, but I, um, I can hear you very well. Okay. Uh, so my question would be: We're speaking about this. Uh, actually, this question a bit a bit refers also to what um, Awatef was talking about. But uh, you were mentioned about this uh, the calligraphy as the as the a way of preserving identity and. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask whether you have been addressing the question of how this calligraphy has been uh, represented in, in uh, terms of contemporary culture as well. So yeah. I'm a little, also looking from my, from my perspective. No, that's why I, uh, I show you my, my presentation. I, had, um, I met uh, many, many Kuwaiti Muslims and the calligraphy is so important for them. So you cannot have a calligraphy on your sacred text 
You can have on the cushion, whatever. So it's because, uh, as I mentioned to you from the beginning, the Allah, God gave it to the Muslims to write down, write down. So this is very important. So UNESCO, they want the intangible cultural heritage inscription uh, 2020. I have to check whether they are inscribed now because uh, when they see Islamic, so my, in Indonesia, we don't have, a, uh, they use only Muslims using calligraphy. But they don't know reading. So uh, this uh, uh, calligraphy is the only cre uh, invention from Islamic uh, uh, culture. The other geometry, arabesque, comes from Byzantine, Sasanian. However, Islamic calligraphy is the only uh, uh, invention from Islamic culture. So they have to read the Quran and all these things. Uh, can I answer uh, also, can I participate? So um, calligraphy is a visual culture also, a, a visual um, a way to express uh, cultural creation. So um, the figurative uh, uh, arts uh, or, or painting, uh, as it's uh, prohibited by um, uh, clerical uh, Islamic um, um, Persons. So, um, but the calligraphy actually um, it's turned to uh, modern art. For example, with with um, graffitis, uh, there is a well known international known um, Tunisian uh, um, graffitist uh, called the Seed, and uh, actually is. Uh, um, use, is, it, he is using the Arab calligraphy as a graffiti to decorate and uh, to art expression in, in many many um, many parts of the of the world. So uh, it's a new uh, way to modernize and to resignify mm. the the uh, calligraphy in the visual uh, uh, culture actually uh, actually. Thank you. More questions, comments, or something to share, maybe. Thank you for your interesting presentation. I, I, I have managed uh, two sessions in parallel, but I, I tried to uh, look nice on your presentation. Uh, just, just a short uh, commentary. Uh, yes, you're right, Avatef. Uh, it's, it's a part of uh, calligraphy. It's a part of visual culture, but only in part, because calligraphy in, in, involves especially the other uh, semiotic resources like like the very important is the is the hand the relation with the hand with the the visual representation this is the important for uh, oriental culture or uh, this type of writing not because the signification they uh, try to transmit and preserve but because is distinct to a way to uh, to to make sign. Uh, now, Hison Lee, if you have uh, any commentary about this, for for our Western culture, uh, using hands, as you already uh, to, uh, remarked in your intervention, Avatev Kedidi, it, it's just an, uh, uh, just a question of representation. It's not a direct representation with the sign. You you know. So what is it for your sign? Uh, what is a, what is the definition of a sign in your perspective? What, what, is the, what, what is the what message is, that they, they the one no, no, no. transmit? What is a, what is the yes message? So uh, you mentioned that the, the message. What is the, the notion of a sign? Once we know the, the definition of a sign, then we can discuss further. You mentioned about the sign. It is not a sign. The word is a sign. It is uh, my exception in a previous intervention is exception of purse. The sign is a construct between uh, the, the, the reader and the reality. 
uh, and this is the uh, really experience of calligraphy they uh, they want to transmit the direct uh, uh, involvement of the semiotic resources in this kind of practice maybe you have time to uh, to uh, to discuss about this but it's very interesting because i see such kind of uh, practice uh, also in turkey in the museum of uh, antalya and this is a very very interesting uh, I, I saw many people who is involved in this practical practice of calligraphy with uh, great enthusiasm and I ask them, I, I talk to them why they practice this, uh, this kind of uh, relation with, uh, with object. And it's very interesting that everybody it's, uh, it's, uh, have an answer. No, I may, sorry, I mentioned to you already, you didn't see my uh, presentation because uh, this is uh, uh, identity, first identity. When there is Islamic calligraphy, Muslim theory, yeah, they are Muslim identity, Arabic calligraphy. However, uh, many, many non-Muslims, they use uh, uh, calligraphy as well. So calligraphy has two functions. What is first the symbolic function, sacredness, message of God. This is very important Muslim. However, not me, because I'm not Muslim. So for me, is I try to see aesthetically because of visualizing. So it depends on background, we see different. Calligraphy signifies differently. Still, we need a collective memory. Yes, you're right. It's a problem of identity. But it's very difficult to semiotics to define God in this context, in the process of constructing our sign, you know, already. Uh, so, uh, can I, can so, I say something, please? Yes, please, Avatar. Calibri, uh, <laughs> is a combination of visual and uh, uh, aesthetic uh, visual and uh, language. Calligraphy is, uh, um, is a way to convert language and uh, image. So uh, we can't say that it's not semiotic. It's semiotic. Chinese uh, use it to use calligraphy also. And they have arts uh, of calligraphy that is very uh, have, uh, uh, ancient roots in their culture. Japanese also, uh, not only Islamic um, tradition. So uh, the, you, I, I think that uh, the semiotic of calligraphy in Arab uh, culture, Islamic culture, uh, have many, many semiotic function. First, identity, but also politic function because, for example, uh, mosques uh, and uh, uh, the place of um, um, religious places, all the, the calligraphy is the way to describe um, Quran in, uh, in the public space. It's a way to record um, people um, uh, of the, the meanings of the Quran. So this is for me is a political uh, function of calligraphy also that have uh, play a role, very important role uh, in the way to um, uh, save the memory, the public mem memory, the cultural memory, but, but, but also had along this century, a very important political role and religious role, of course. So um, uh, I, I, I am okay with this. Yes, I am. No, no, that's I why, I, no, no. totally agree with that's you. Why I mentioned, that. Yeah, that's why I mentioned that the minaret. I showed the picture minaret. They put the Quranic word to show Islam is bigger than any other religion. So when the first Islamic world, Umayyad, Damascus, so they, uh, they put the calligraphy to show Islam, the greatness of Islam as well. Islam. So, however, uh, calligraphy in Indonesia, calligraphy in China, whatever, and same our calligraphy has many, many meanings. And the first is uh, identity. Some people have, might have identity, some people don't have identity. Some people have a political reason. Some people, they like calligraphy because beautiful or whatever. So depends on your background, depends on your memory. Calligraphy signifies a different way to your perception, to your understanding.
Yes, if uh, it's very interesting discussion, maybe you have time to uh, to develop them uh, this idea in the future. Thank you all for your intervention. It's uh, it's a very nice meeting, and uh, I'm glad to see you again. So I invite you to the next uh, master lecture of Mikhail Ilin. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.